Ladies and gentlemen, they give you a script to use. So my script starts with Alan DeLinda to introduce panel and welcome back from technical sessions. So this is the panel. And welcome back from the technical sessions. We're glad you're here. I hope some of you went. Uh, I am Alan DeLuna. I'm the Executive Vice President of the American Astronautical, Astronautical Society, AAS. And then they gave me a little hand scribbled thing that says, oh, by the way, do this also. So a nice tightly typed script that three or four different people have gone through and validated and verified and made sure I wouldn't say anything embarrassing. I will anyway. And then they give me this. And this is really important, though. This is for part of the Innovation Forum. And if you haven't had a chance to go to the Innovation Forum next to the exhibit hall, go in there and take a walk around. They have folks in there that say, have badges that say evangelist. And they're trying to evangelize you guys to be able to come in and talk about challenges and solutions to those challenges. Tonight, we have a thing called speed matching. And they're going to have some experts from NASA and CASES and some people who have been to ISS as uh, uh, providers of services before. And you get to go in and have one-on-ones with these folks for five minutes apiece. They'll ring a bell or shoot a horn or something, then you go to the next person. But this is one-on-one. -on -one. It's not a group-on-one or one-on-a-group. -on -one. It's one-on-one. -on -one. So take advantage of it. It starts at 645. So as soon as we get done here, go in, have a couple of drinks, uh, let it loosen you up, and then go and uh, do the speed matching. Jim told me not to talk about Howard the Duck or about the uh, Battlestar Galactica effect. Any of you guys were at the uh, Von Braun this past year? Anybody go to the Von Braun? Okay, then uh, they don't know the story. So what we've got uh, right now, we have the, the evolving commercial laboratory, what's next in research capabilities. And the really important thing about this is these are folks who are developing other capabilities, other abilities of the ISS to support researchers and technology developers as they go to the ISS and, and do their work. If we didn't have these kinds of folks going up and doing this, the utilization of the ISS would not be anywhere near what it is today, and it won't grow to what it will grow to in the next couple of years. And so our chairman for this, or moderator for this, is Kurt Costello. Kurt's the ISS program chief scientist out of JSC. Kurt. Thank you, Alan. I'm really glad to see everybody uh, come back from the technical sessions at the end of a great day here, our first day of plenary sessions. And uh, I'm really excited because I get to talk a little bit about science and what makes the National Lab special. Uh, the National Lab, um, National Labs in general have a long storied history. Uh, from the turn of the century, DOE now operates 17 different national labs. And when you think of a national lab, which NASA now operates one of, uh, why do people congregate to national labs? What's the benefit? Uh, people look to national labs as magnets for attracting researchers who uh, can share ideas, can uh, develop systems very quickly, develop their own hypotheses, and bring that to bear. Why do they come to national labs? Typically, a national lab has a unique resource, a unique laboratory setting that they can offer those researchers. I'd like to say that at NASA and the ISS National Lab, we have the most unique resource that you can get to today, which is the space environment. And whether you're going there for the microgravity background or you're going there for space exposure, uh, the near-Earth uh, sensing environment, or astrophysics even, you're accessing the National Lab to do new and wonderful things. There are many discoveries yet to come for the National Lab, but to be effective as a National Lab, we have to continue to develop those capabilities that the lab has, the facilities that the lab has, uh, to attract new researchers, to really be able to do that state-of-the-art research. And today, uh, our panelists are going to be talking about advances in that area where they're developing new capabilities, new platforms for researchers to use to help us build that commercial marketplace for research in space in low Earth orbit. So in the order of appearance today, I want to introduce the panel. Uh, first is uh, John Vellinger, president and CEO of TechShot. Uh, next to him, Mark Gittleman, President and CEO of Alpha Space. 
next to him, Doug Wyatt, program manager for AECOM. Uh, Jose Benavides, uh, project manager, Spheres Astro B facility from NASA Ames Research Center. And last but not least, Jack Ix, our senior vice president for geospatial solutions at Teledyne Brown Engineering. Uh, each of our panelists is going to uh, be doing a presentation and then we'll take questions at the end. We are using the app to collect questions. So during the course of the presentations, if you have questions you wanna ask, please uh, use the app and we'll come to those at the end of the presentation. So first up, John Vellinger. All right, thank you very much. I just wanted to thank Cases for inviting me to be able to come and kind of share our story. Um, TechShot, um, our tagline is innovate, integrate, and inspire. So we are excited about providing payload equipment for research and technology on the International Space Station. And I'm here today to share with you um, some of our story. So I'd like to start and talk a little bit about our continuum of services. Uh, TechShot is a one-stop shop. Uh, we like to be able to work with the investigator, understand their requirements, develop the concept of operations, and then develop prototype hardware. And then we like to take that prototype hardware and then test it, and then retest it, and then test it again. Our philosophy at TechShot is we like to fly hardware when it's almost worn out. We like to really be able to be able to prove the concept on the ground before we ever take it to space. So we have the, provide, we have the capability to work with the user to be able to develop their requirements, develop the hardware, and see them through the entire flight experiment. Like we say, we develop the picks and the shovels that enable research to be done on the International Space Station. Some of our facilities that we have available are the bone densitometer, rodent research, we work in cell research, um, we do protein crystal growth, um, we've done C. elegans, plant research, Drosophila, colloids, 3D organ and tissue printing is some of our upcoming uh, hardware capabilities. And then I think one of the very important things that's on this slide is there's a blank. What would you like to accomplish? Because we want to work with you and help you accomplish your goals and your objectives in space. I'd like to share with you a little bit about our bone densitometer. It's a dual x-ray machine. It operates on 35 and 80 kV, so it does a comparison of the two different scans. Um, it's able to detect and work with osteoporosis and muscle wasting diseases. Uh, we've worked with Eli Lilly, Narvatus, UCLA. Um, we just conducted five bone scans on orbit today, and uh, we have five more scheduled for tomorrow. So we're very excited about this uh, capability. Um, and we've conducted over 100 bone scans of rodents on the International Space Station with this device. Our next piece of equipment is our Advanced Space Experiment Processor. Um, this equipment um, originally was designed and flew with uh, Senator John Glenn on SDS-95. Our whole concept of this device was to be able to develop a modular configuration where you could keep the housing the electronics, the insulation, all the things that support an experiment up on orbit, and then just take the experiment cassettes back and forth each time so you can increase the throughput and get more scientific output uh, with this device. So here again, you know, the sky's the limit. What do you want to develop and do in that experiment cassette? So we would work with you and develop different types of experiments, whether it's cell culturing, you know, whatever, we can do it in these cassettes on orbit. Sample transfer tool. Um, we actually worked with this device uh, with the smart cycler experiment that uh, Ames Research Center conducted. Um, it's a double containment device. It, it's really handy because a lot of times the investigator wants to take up frozen samples. So it provides the containment, allows it to be stowed in a minus 80 degrees freezer, and then it has a lure fitting so that once you get on orbit, you can thaw your sample and begin your experiment. So it's a very useful, clever tool that has a very small footprint. The next exciting piece of hardware capability that we have is the MVP. Uh, the MVP is a dual centrifuge. It has two centrifuges, one on top of the other. 
Um, they can simulate anywhere from zero to two G in one tenth degree G increments. We, have, we provide thermal control. We have 12 experiment modules. Here again, our whole design philosophy is whatever you want to put in your experiment module, you can, you know, the sky's the limit, whatever your configuration, whatever science you want to dream up. The, the beauty about the MVP is that a lot of investigators like to rotate one carousel and keep the other carousel stationary. So now your experiment samples are in the same environment. They've experienced the same thermal profile, the same vibration, the same conditions for both groups. And you can have them, you know, conducted side by side. So each carousel actually will hold six um, experiment modules. The next device is our PONS, which is the ability to be able to provide nutrient, it's a nutrient delivery system that is used in conjunction uh, with Veggie. One of the exciting things about the PONS project is we actually did that in, in conjunction with Tupperware. And it's a great illustration of where an implementation partner worked with NASA, worked with industry, and came up with a research model that was very effective and very profitable. Another exciting device that we're beginning to work on is our rodent centrifuge. Um, the rodent centrifuge, we think, is a facility that's very much needed up on orbit. Um, the rodent centrifuge is configured in a quad locker. So basically it's four standard express rack lockers. So we have the rotating centrifuge on the facility rotates um, in and out of the, uh, the plane um, around the axis in and out of the, of the plane of the facility. So you have on the rotor, you can, can reconfigure it to have either three cages, um, which would be able to contain 200 gram rats, um, I'm sorry, four cages, that would have th three 200 gram rats, two 400 gram rats, or you'd be able to have one large rat, or mice, you could actually put mice in the facility as well. But here again, this is a capability where you can provide incremental centrification of the samples, and it has tremendous capability for on-orbit research. The next project I want to highlight is the TechShot Fab Lab. We're working on the TechShot, TechShot Fab Lab in conjunction with the Marshall Space Flight Center. It's basically an express rack locker facility. It's an all-in-one solution where we're able to do additive manufacturing on orbit, additive and actually subtractive. So the whole goal of this device is to be able to take this type of capability into deep space so that you don't have to actually take the part with you, you build it when you get there. So it has the capability to be able to print metals, plastics, ceramics, electronics, and it's a very unique and powerful tool. Then the last facility that I'd like to, to highlight this morning, this afternoon, would be the biofabrication facility, as we call it, the BFF. And uh, the, the bioprinter is actually scheduled to fly on orbit uh, next spring. And it basically has the ability to be able to um, utilize different bio inks and construct different tissues on orbit. And the great thing about doing bioprinting in microgravity is that you don't have to have that scaffolding structure uh, in the facility, in the, in the bio ink. You can actually avoid that because you don't have gravity. So it allows you a lot of unique capability to be able to print in microgravity. So I think there was a video, I don't know, did that, do I need to back up on that one? So basically what we're doing there is we're able to, uh, we printed a, uh, vestibular, we, we printed a uh, neonatal ventricle um, chamber uh, during a parabolic flight uh, with human stem cells. And so the, the, bio, the BFF will be able to actually take whatever kind of tissue we develop and print on orbit and then put it in a bioreactor to be able to vascularize that tissue. So those are the facilities I'd like to highlight this afternoon. Again, I want to thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, please come see us next door at booth 26. So again, thank you for the opportunity, and I'll pass it on. Over to you, Mark.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Gittleman, and I'm here to talk to you this afternoon about Alpha Space Test and Research Alliance, or Alpha Space, and MISI, our facility which we believe provides the shortest path to external flight testing that's ever been. Here's what I'm going to talk about briefly, how we can help you, how to do business with us, how MISI works, show you a little on-orbit video, and then a little bit on what I think is the bigger picture. This picture shows our location out on ELC-2 on the port side of the space station outside. So how can we help you, the technology developer, the scientist? Well, by providing the easiest and lowest cost way to conduct science or to space qualify or evaluate or demonstrate new technologies in the vacuum of space. There's a picture on the right that shows Missy. I'm going to have to get up so I can use this laser pointer a little bit. There's Missy with our carriers around the outside and our avionics on the inside. And we fly those carriers up and back every six months, more or less, twice a year. And, we, and so that gives you the opportunity to fly frequently. The facility itself is permanently installed. And our carriers give us views of Ram Zenith, Wake, and Nader. It's privately owned and operated, and our services we provide on a turnkey and fixed price commercial basis. So there's some pictures of carriers there on the upper right. The first one is empty uh, with exactly 181 one inch circles to demonstrate uh, where material samples could go. But the picture on the right shows what it really looks like. That, that carrier on the right is up in on the space station right now, you can see a wide variety of passive material samples. Now, I emphasize the passive because MIS, the M in MISI stands for materials, and that's the heritage. Uh, there were eight MISI flights, uh, eight NASA MISI flights. But now we have uh, the ability to provide both uh, uh, active and passive science. So we can provide power and data through the facility to the carriers. We take data continuously at one hertz. We take high fidelity photographs once a month and we deliver that data to our customers. In fact, you can see on, on the carrier there, that's our camera trolley about half deployed. So what can you do with something like that? Well, whoops, go back. There's a little theme here, almost anything. We're flying new materials, new layups, coatings, treatments, electronics, sensors, we're going to fly a new antenna shortly. Uh, we can fly cameras. We have a proposal outstanding for flying some micro thrusters down underneath one of those trays so it's con to totally contained and safe. We're flying our first biological experiment in November. Uh, we're talking about radiation experiments. Really, if it fits, we can fly it. Uh, the pictures on the right are actual on-orbit pictures delivered to our customers. We have sensors in these pictures. We've got some fabrics and a variety of different materials. We do all of the physical and analytical integration. Uh, we do all the flight certification, payload safety panels, all those things. That's our job. What we like to tell our customers is, you, you bring us your stuff and we'll take care of the rest. Uh, your confidential and proprietary information remains yours. NASA's committed to that, and so are we. We command and control the MISI and the carriers from our Payload Operations Control Center in Houston, which is pictured on the right, and we use uh, commercial contracting terms. Here's a little graphic uh, that kind of illustrates what I was just talking about. You come and see us at booth 24 this afternoon. You'll be on orbit within a few months, or maybe not a few months. <laughs> um, we exchange a little paperwork. We learn what we need to know in order to provide you with a good quote. Um, sign that commercial contract. There's a picture of our 10K clean room where we're integrating uh, samples for the, for the mission that's up there right now. We take care of all the coordination with NASA and the launch provider. The, the installation on orbit, the operations on orbit. 
We will close the carriers if there's uh, some sort of transient environmental anomaly, like a visiting spacecraft or a spacewalking astronaut. We want to preserve and preserve the science, protect it. We bring it all back, and then we deintegrate it and return it to you. Here's a couple more pictures. Uh, the picture on the left is in our clean room, integrating the Missy 9 flight that's up there right now. We've got a thermal back chamber um, for getting ready to fly. There's a, a close-up of that same carrier, and we can launch on anything that goes to the space station. These are on-orbit pictures. What happens is the carriers go up closed. They go, they're inside. The astronauts install them on this Missy transfer tray here. So you can see one, two, three, four Missy carriers installed on that Missy transfer tray, and they're about to go out through the Japanese airlock. They go out. They are picked up by the Canadian robotic system, the SPDM. Uh, in that next picture down here, they're still on the transfer tray, about to be removed. And then the next two pictures show them actually being installed onto the Missy facility. And just a little fun fact, that tool that, uh, that the robot's got in its grip right there, that was one of my very first flight projects, flight hardware projects back in the early 90s. A couple more pictures of Missy on orbit. The ones on the left give you a good idea of, of what it looks like. You can see up here, that's the same shot we had before. Down here, you can see the carriers, one, two, three, four, five. And then the boxes in the middle, those are our avionics. And so those are ORUs. They will be, uh, potentially will be upgraded over time. And certainly, we can repair them if ever required by just exchanging them. And then a couple nice shots on the right of our carriers open with the trays. There's two trays on every car uh, carrier with a hinge in the middle. And so you can see what, what some of those uh, carriers look like today on orbit. So in a little video to set this up, there's the Canadian robot system here. We've got the Missy transfer tray. It's about to grab a carrier. Using that tool, it's going to pull it out of the tray, out of the transfer tray, that is. So there it is removing it. Um, Translating over to get it aligned with the Missy facility. This is dramatically sped up. If you watch this in real time, it's, it's like watching paint dry. But um, we don't have three days to watch it happen. So getting lined up and then coming in, there's an alignment system. When the mechanical connection is made, so are the power and data connections. So it's all one easy motion. You can see it coming in pretty precisely. It's got those guides. It's going to push in, lock, and now everything is made up. Now, now you'll see the carriers opening. We wait until dark to take our pictures so that we can have consistent lighting. So there, we're opening. One, again, very sped up. Uh, two. And then there'll be one down on the lower right. And then we'll see the camera trolleys come out. There's the lower right. And it takes us, you'll see how fast the camera goes. It takes about 30 minutes to get the pictures. And there we go. So what does it all mean? Well. We're trying to make it simple. We're trying to create opportunities for new products, for science, and also for new products. We're trying to open the base to more organizations. We're, we're trying to lower the barrier for entry. We have lowered the barrier to entry for new products by speeding technology development, reducing costs and time to market for new products. We're, we're opening the supply chain to new companies with new ideas. And the fact that we return stuff routinely means that now you really can test something on orbit. You're immediately TRL-8 if you speak technology readiness level just by testing in space. So now you can sell yourself as flight proven. And we're working with everybody from startups to aerospace giants, product developers, manufacturers, variety of government agencies, and academia, even including high schools. We've, 
we've priced our we've priced it so reasonably that it's within reach of high schools even. And so we think we've created the easiest and least costly way to demonstrate, evaluate, or flight qualify new products and technologies for use outside in the extravehicular environment. I'm Mark Gittleman. Uh, Kevin Heath, our business development manager, is also here this week. You can find us both at Booth 24. We would love to talk with you and hear your ideas and see how we can help. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. It's exciting to see such a, a, a fully automated facility, brand new, operating on station. Oh, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. We just, uh, we just launched in March. It is brand new. Yep. Over to Doug. Okay, ready? I, I'm going to stand and use the pointer, if that's OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you the Spectrum project. Spectrum is a, a NASA LASSO partnership and this brings a new capability to the International Space Station. Spectrum is a multispectral unit that we'll talk about in just a moment. You may remember that early in the days of the space station, the green fluorescent imager from the space shuttle days was transferred to the space station, some incompatibility issues, and it was removed. So the capability of multispectral, multifluorescent imaging of biologic materials has not been on the space station since that time. As you, as you can see, it is a green, yellow, orange, red, and cyan. There are five spectral ranges of the spectrum instrument. The spectrum instrument is designed to look at biologic material, either unicellular material, single-celled organisms, plant material, or uh, simple life, invertebrate life forms like worms can all be visualized with this system, okay? And it uses the concept of an excitation light with emission filters that can be rotated throughout a process that are then captured visually at ultra high resolution and in multiple depth of field that we'll talk about in just a minute. With inside the habitat of the, of the spectrum instrument, we can control temperature, humidity, the carbon dioxide, the VOC level, particularly the ethylenes, the light intensity and the cycle time that the uh, biologic materials are exposed to whatever frequencies you're using in your experiment. Uh, it will be in, in the express rack. It's in the standard uh, module for the express rack and we already know where it's gonna go in locker number seven. Uh, this shows a few images from the test facility itself and as you can see, these are multispectral images of just some simple cell material that have been excited in the green range. Uh, if you look at the actual image, you see inside, you see the fluorescence wheel for the multiple light sources, and then right beside of that is the wheel for the camera with its filter wheel. Inside the filter wheel for the camera, there are 10 filters uh, install those filters can be replaced between experiments by the astronauts on board the ISS. So there is a multiple combination of approaches that you can use for your research. The camera is a monochrome camera. Uh, we can actually image down to 13 micrometers in size. That's getting down to actual cell size. And the, the way this system works is we use ligated proteins to energize cells and whatever organisms are in the, the, the petri dishes in, within your test carousel. And then you actually can image the actual genetic expression of the proteins inside that organism. And so this, this is a new capability. The camera sees the entire petri dish. It's, this instrument is designed for the standard 10 centimeter petri dish, but it will also uh, accept multi uh, uh, container type of petri dishes and it will also accept odd sized petri dishes as well whatever kind of container you can put in there that meets the standard size the really cool thing about this at least in my opinion is that this has, is a multi-focus instrument 
as you focus through the spectral range, the camera is actually focusing on the front of the organism and then and incrementally throughout the organism. So when you get your actual image back, you'll actually have a 3D image of that genetic expression of whatever protein or whatever organelle or whatever, whatever it is you are looking for in that particular type of organism. So you get a 3D image from this out of very small samples. Time-lapse capable, programmable exposure. We can look in infrared. Uh, we can do composite images of red, green, blue. And then we can transfer these images at 2.3 frames per second, which is, is very fast. Uh, it will be in the destiny module, just to give you an a, 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 a idea of where it will be. We actually have a space for it. Uh, this will fit, fit right in there. And we think we are going to be, we know we are going to be ready for launch in spring of 2019. Okay, it is being assembled even as we left KSC to come up here. And uh, this is a wonderful new tool for us to have on the space station. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Mm -hmm. Next up, Jose Benavides. Okay, uh, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. And I will be speaking to the Spheres Astro B uh, ISS Free Flyer facility on uh, the space station. And I've had the great privilege of leading the team at NASA Ames that supports this facility. And I hope to continue the theme I think you're, you're hearing here about uh, ISS facilities that uh, are very uh, customer focused and uh, provide a lot of value uh, to uh, operating on the uh, space station. Uh, first started with uh, Spheres. It was a uh, facility spearheaded by MIT back in 2006. Um, and continued by Ames in 2010. And so we have a lot of experience uh, uh, operating a facility on the space station uh, to be very risk tolerant, to be very uh, customer focused and uh, uh, modular and extensible to allow all kinds of research on the space station. And so the next generation free flyer that continues in that tradition is called Astrobe. Uh, first started about three or four years ago. Uh, it's designed uh, to, uh, be, again, be very modular, extensible, and can cater to all kinds of different research uh, by researchers all around the country uh, on the space station, uh, focusing on uh, mobile free-flying uh, robotics. It, uh, there will be three on the space station, very similar to spheres, capable of uh, doing multi-satellite uh, operations or multi-robot communications. Uh, there will be a docking station where Astro B can uh, uh, dock, recharge, uh, do wireless telemetry down to the ground uh, and wired. And a uh, built-in perching arm used for the uh, 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 payload uh, interface. Uh, so the perching arm will allow to grab onto handrails, pan and tilt its view. Um, and then there are three payload bays on uh, Astro B that allows extensible hardware to be added and uh, expanded. Uh, to give it different uh, sensing and uh, different capabilities. Six total cameras for uh, various purposes, including a cell phone class HD camera that can give eyes uh, on the ground to what's going on on the space station. And when first uh, conceived, it of course was uh, designed to replace Spheres as a general purpose research platform on station for mobile free-flying robotics. Uh, but in addition to that, there were some very specific goals of being a mobile uh, camera for ISS situational awareness and uh, to serve as a mobile sensor platform on ISS. We think these have a lot of purposes and uh, uh, useful, um, adds a lot of useful value to what goes on on, on space station. So roughly uh, a foot cubed is the uh, size and uh, targeting about 10 kilograms uh, in mass. Uh, so, a lot of different capabilities that uh, distinguish Astro B from Spheres, a lot of new features and, and uh, things that have been upgraded, uh, Spheres being up there over 10 years, there's a lot of that's been happening in uh, computing and miniaturization that allows us to pack a lot more uh, computing capabilities. Uh, so uh, referred to in this figure is a speaker microphone, uh, and I think you're going to see another theme here where Astro B is being uh, designed to be a lot more interactive. Uh, it can uh, uh, support uh, human-robot interaction. 
uh, with the uh, speaker microphone, laser pointer, um, uh, touch screen, uh, turn signals, all these things that can be customized and utilized uh, to interact with crew uh, and different things on, on space station. Um, the, you can see the perching arm uh, is going to be on the top uh, rear uh, payload bay that's going to allow it to hold on to handrails and support its uh, mobile camera uh, capabilities to uh, all by itself in an automated way pan and tilt its view anywhere inside of the uh, USOS section of space station. Uh, this gives an overview of some of the uh, facilities we have available at NASA Ames just down the road. We have a flight lab where we build the flight hardware for Astrobe, uh, the uh, engineering evaluation laboratory where we do environmental testing. Uh, and then in particular, we have the Granite Lab and our MGTF, microgravity testing facility. And this is where we test out software for the uh, free flyers uh, before going up to space station. And with the Granite Lab, we have a uh, full three degree of freedom motion. Uh, across a granite table that allows us to first test out the software, as well as a full gantry in our MGTF lab that allows for full six-stop uh, testing of the uh, free flyer. And then, of course, our mission operations center where we can interact uh, with the uh, robots on the space station uh, during a test session. And so uh, continuing the tradition of what SPHERES uh, and MIT did early on, Astro B will be focused on a guest scientist program that opens up its capabilities to researchers all around the country. And uh, what do we offer as a facility? We offer an Astro B robotics uh, software simulation. It is open source software. You can get it now from GitHub. Uh, full flight stack is there in the simulator, uh, the same software flying on Astro B. It's open sourced and on GitHub can be downloaded and operated um, and developed on. Uh, the uh, same uh, software that runs on that simulator can run on the hardware and ultimately on, on space station. Uh, the ground hardware, uh, we have uh, three units on the ground that will be utilized for testing um, before uh, software goes up to space station. Uh, I mentioned the labs at NASA Ames, uh, just down the way, about uh, 50 miles south of here. Uh, lab documentation and training, we provide users what they need to, to utilize Astro B. Uh, ISS uh, payload partner. So ultimately, we are a partner in the ISS payload process, um, and uh, we support whatever it takes to get your science on space station. How can I use ASRB, and what does it take? So uh, we do, as I mentioned, provide a lot of documentation. NASA.gov slash That's our website, and that's where you can find the guest scientist guide and the interface that control document uh, for the mechanical interface. Uh, and then I'm referring to different types of payloads that you might want to uh, do on space station. Um, are you adding new hardware or are you uh, a software payload? A lot of research uh, might just need to update the software on Astro B to study different control algorithms or different formation flying uh, versus um, a new hardware that gets uh, built onto Astro B. A little bit longer time frame, but uh, definitely doable on Astro B. Uh, ground demonstrations or ISS operations, so you could. Uh, do preliminary testing and uh, demonstration in, in, on the ground, or do a full ISS operation. And uh, just to give you a sense of uh, our user community, we do have a, a working group with the, all the users of both Spheres and Astro B on a quarterly basis. Every other uh, working group uh, is in person, where we share with each other our experiences in operating Spheres uh, and Astro B as a um, uh, payload on ISS. And uh, over 40 projects have expressed interest in utilizing Astro B. Uh, and these are the seven projects that are for sure we're working with directly on operating uh, on the space station. This includes Zero Robotics. It's a continuation uh, from Spheres, where MIT leads uh, a STEM outreach activity for middle school and high school students that are programming against this every year, very much like the first robotics program, uh, but more software focused. And uh, middle school and high school pro students are learning to program for the very first time and seeing their code operating uh, on the space station live. So it's a really great uh, outreach activity that MIT leads with that. We're also working with the Naval Postgraduate School on acrobatics. How do you uh, manipulate the Astro B to move across ISS without any propulsion? So using just the perching arm to go from handrail to handrail. So some really interesting research there. 
Astrobotic and Bosch with their deep audio analytics trying to characterize the uh, audio environment of ISS, trying to detect anomalies. Uh, so some really interesting research with that. And I'll point out also um, uh, Astrobotic, Zerobotics, uh, both cases sponsored. So, so uh, uh, big thumbs up there for <laughs> cases. Uh, Stanford uh, looking into um, a gecko manipulation uh, in microgravity. So some really interesting uh, research there where they're adding onto the existing perching arm a gecko appendage that can uh, manipulate things on a uh, space station. Uh, Realm uh, RFID reader, there's a group out of JSC working on logistics reduction and trying to integrate onto Astrobee an RFID scanner that can track uh, different objects on, on space station. And then uh, ref uh, just yesterday, we had a joint working group with JAXA talking about some joint activity where we're going to be working with uh, both NPAW and Astrobe and joint operations and looking at a STEM outreach activity for uh, the Asia Pacific region. And then some ground studies uh, with uh, Florida Institute of Technology and RINGS, Tethers uh, Unlimited looking at uh, Astro Porter um, and some uh, uh, payload uh, mobility across space station, uh, New Mexico State University as well, looking at uh, their own research using Astrobe. So uh, full plate, we've got a lot of research going on, uh, and uh, this just provides a map of all the different uh, researchers across the country utilizing uh, Astrobe. And here's a calendar of SPHERES activities uh, on space station, and then some of the Astrobe activities coming down the pike. Uh, just gives you a sense for our uh, operating tempo, uh, averaging about three, four test sessions a quarter, um, and so we keep busy, and then we're going to get even busier with Astrobe, which is not as reliant on crew time, and so it's fully automated. It can do a lot of things uh, without crew time, and so that'll be really exciting for get, getting a lot more done on, on Space Station. Uh, as I mentioned, nasa.gov slash Astrobe, nasa.gov slash Spheres to learn more about what we've been doing with Spheres, uh, and of course, we're on, on Twitter as well. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, any questions? I think we'll leave. I think we'll to get to those in a minute. But uh, first, Jack Hicks. Before I begin, I'd like to assure you guys that I'm smarter than I look. So I know I'm what stands between you guys and your first beer of the night. And I am quite confident that if I run long and you miss all the free drinks, none of you are going to like me very much. <clears throat> I just thought I'd give you a brief, uh, just a brief information on Teledyne Technologies. That's what Teledyne Brown is a part of. You know, we've got 2017 revenue of just under $3 billion, and we've got about 11,000 employees worldwide. I'm part of Teledyne Brown Engineering, which is part of the engineered systems. Just a brief history, and I give you this because Teledyne Brown celebrated 65-year anniversary this year. It was established to support Dr. Werner von Braun's rocket team. <clears throat> you know, we've... Uh, we've uh, continue to be a part of every space program, every major space program since the 60s. We've been around a long time, and we're going to be here to stay. So we're a trusted partner, we're ethical, and we honor our commitments. That's part of our culture. Before I start talking about muses, I thought I'd make sure we understand terminology, you know, that we're all speaking the same music. Custom is made or done to order for a particular customer. That's what a lot of the payloads on the ISSR. They're custom, they're expensive, they're built for a specific purpose. Commercial is making or intended to make a profit. And I can assure you, inside Teledyne Technologies, there's no intended. Commercial is making a profit. <clears throat> so uh, if we look at imaging payloads, you know, if we look at case just if you're going to put a payload on board the ISS, you've got your choice between a you know, a small satellite or the ISS, it's more cost than a large satellite. It's probably on par with a small satellite, and it's a lot more expensive than CubeSats, because let's face it, there's humans up there, there's a lot of interface and safety verifications, and you really need a specialized skill set to successfully get a payload on, on orbit. So MUSES, the purpose when it was uh, developed, was to break that customization. We, we have muses that basically says the instrument provider doesn't have to worry about the ISS. They don't have to worry about the verifications. They, we take care of everything. 
So bottom line is they focus on the science and we take care of everything else. We can handle four payloads simultaneously. They're robotically installed and removed. And, uh, and as I said before, they're buffered from the interface verifications. And just to give you an example, Muses was well over 1,000. It took us uh, about 1,100 safety in, in interface verifications. Our first Muses payload that we'll talk about in a minute had about a little less than 250. You know, and our target is to be under 100, and we'll talk about what that means. But it was launched on June 3rd, 2017, and it's been operational aboard the ISS for about, uh, about a year. Well, I think you all know, uh, Muses was sort of conceived in 2011, started in 2012, and it went on orbit in 2017. So we, we sort of, uh, there was a big change in the launch environment, there's a big change in the launch providers. It was, an, you know, the, the market exploded while we were developing Muses. So we had, to, we had to adapt. So what we come up with is a configurable interface unit, and that basically handles the communication and the command and control from the instrument to Muses and ISS. So my customers, the instrument providers, they don't have to modify their instrument. They don't have to develop a canister. We take care of that for them. In addition, you know, I, I, can, I can handle multiple payloads in that canister. So uh, that allows me to drop down and compete with CubeSats and smaller by giving them space within an imaging payload, and it basically expands my market to, uh, to generate more revenue. And our, our goal with that reusable, configurable canister is that we can be a contract to launch in less than 12 months. Our first payload just went up on June 29th. It's on board the ISS, and it's waiting for deployment. It's a uh, it's cooperation with the German Aerospace Agency, which is DLR, and as part of their launch, they made the statement that uh, it was the most successful program they've had. It was the lowest cost in the fastest time. Now, that's, you know, DLR is not known for speed. They tell me they're known for being good, but still, it's their, it's their fastest program that they've ever developed. It's a hyperspectral imagery. 30 meter GSD, 2.55 nanometer bands, and that equates to 235 bands. We should have images available in Q4 of, of 18. So just to give you a brief, so multi-user system for Earth sensing. Technical success, absolutely. It's up there, it's operating, and uh, it's working just fine. Commercial success, you know, not yet. It, it was a lot of money to develop that, and I've got a big bill to pay back for technology, but we are, we're working on it, and I think it's, uh, it's going to be a good example of how we can take a commercial imaging platform mounted on the largest hosted payload satellite in orbit and really cut the cost of uh, space qualification, technology demonstration, or Earth imaging by about 50%. We will be, our prices will be well under 50% of an equivalent free flyer at the high end and will be very competitive with CubeSat uh, payloads. That's it. So it's up to you with your questions how long we go, but I'm not, I'm not the one that lost you your free beer. Thank you, Jack. So I think that will bring us to the question and answer session here. Uh, while we get those uh, spooled up in the back, I, I think I want to go ahead and start off with a question for the panel, which is, we talked a lot about the uh, new technological advances and facility capability that we're developing for space station. I, I want to ask each of you just briefly, how do you stay in touch with the, the scientific, the research community, the technology community, to really get the feedback of what is cutting edge and where should we be going in development for future facilities. So I'll just uh, ask that to the panel. If you want to chime in, then we'll get the, uh, the questions from the back. Sure. I think it's important to attend conferences like this, understand what are some of your research goals and objectives. I think there's always a combination of trying to maintain hardware capabilities with science so I think, I think we're always looking to industry and what, what's the technology, what's on the horizon. And so, you know, what, what is the researcher doing in his lab? You know, what's the material scientist doing in their lab? 
and do we have the hardware that we can perform those kind of same experimentation in space? And if we don't, then there's a void, and that's what we try to fill. Okay. Well, I love it when, when someone asks, could you? They have an idea, and they want to know if we could help them fly it. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times, that's where, for, for us, that's where our facility upgrade ideas come from, is, is could you do this? The micro thruster is a perfect example. We hadn't really thought about that until, until this researcher asked us if we could, and then we figured out that we could, and, and uh, it became a, at least a hypothetical capability. Um, and same thing with radiation testing or other biological testing. So the market is gonna lead, is gonna lead us um, through those kinds of questions. Uh, conferences like this, for sure, Sales calls, you know, when you tell people that you have a facility on space station that you test stuff with, it, that's a great conversation starter, right? People want to know more, and then, and, and I almost always get, well, could you do this, or could you do that? And those are good questions, and I think, I think that's, where, that's where we're going to learn what the market wants, and um, whether, whether it's science or technology development, and, and we're leading the market now, but eventually the market is, uh, I hope, going to start leading us. I, I, those are great answers. I would just add that going back to the concept of the national labs, within the national labs there's a series of research programs that always fall under the category of directed research. You know, it's, there's basic research, there's applied research, but there's directed research, and directed research is research for a specific cause to address a specific answer or a specific need. And uh, the market provides those questions and more and more, the other national labs are following directed research programs to answer those questions because that's what the people wanna know, that's what the people wanna pay for. So it's important to keep up with what the market is requesting not, not just the academic literature, but the market literature as well. And they're not mutually exclusive because uh, people look at anybody that's a scientist or a, a, an engineer that does research that looks into the future, they will understand based on what they've evaluated where you need to go. And that may be 10 years ahead, 20 years ahead, 30 days ahead, one year to launch, who knows? But you just, you have to keep up with that. Um, so I'll, I'll point to two, two things uh, that we pay particular attention to. Uh, I think I referred earlier to a uh, user, Spheres has to be a working group that we hold on a quarterly basis uh, where we solicit uh, presentations from all Spheres and Astrobe users and we share information uh, with each other, not just about um, our experiences as a payload, but our research and our goals uh, of what we want to do on space station. And then I'll also point to the fact that as a NASA-funded facility, we remain uh, particularly tuned to NASA's goals in technology development and space exploration, and NASA's goals uh, of uh, deep space spacecraft beyond ISS. So what are the technologies that are, need to be developed to enable those, uh, those goals uh, that NASA has? And so we, we remain particularly uh, vigilant with those uh, efforts. Maybe I'll just add the, the commercialization of the ISS is, is still in the early stages. We're all still priming the pump. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we all have an obligation. We've got to evangelize the capabilities and the, and the uh, opportunities on the space station because if there's, a, if there's a mission or an experiment that can either go free fly or ISS, you know, if we all have sharp commercial pencils, it should be extremely cost effective, maybe less than half price to do that on the ISS. And I think the Science Mission Directorate and, and other areas, we've got to get that message out and then everything will sort of take care of itself because it's, it's a compelling argument that says, look, I can do the same thing you need to do in a free flyer and you can leave half your money for other things, that's a, that gets anybody's attention. Yeah. That's great, and I think that goes to the definition of an evolving laboratory. Uh, be open to people asking, hey, could you do this? 
and then addressing the, uh, addressing the ideas that are out there because uh, you guys can come forward to these guys and, and ask, hey, how do I fit into your facility? All right, if we've got questions in the back with John, John, could you? Uh... Uh, yes, we received some questions. Uh, the first one is for all panelists. Uh, what is the most challenging part about engineering new lab technology for the space environment? Take a stab at that. I think you know you just you have to think differently. Um, things just don't always respond the same way that they do in your laboratory here on the ground, and so I think that's why we advocate testing, because you, you know you really need to understand the process and think about the application of that technology in a microgravity environment, and that creates the challenges for the technology to make sure that you're able to replicate the same process or procedure that you like to see here on the ground. Anybody else? If, if the question's about if the question's about designing an on-orbit testing facility uh, and not the equipment to go in it, then then that's an, uh, you've got all the challenges of designing something for space, which most of the people here are familiar with. But you're also designing something that has to be useful for its life as the market changes and as what people want to test and evaluate change. And so you have to think about what that facility how you're going to upgrade the facility. Well, of course, maintain it and do all those things like you do for a, a spacecraft that's going to be there a while. But then also, how you're going to evolve it and make it useful to your customers, make it ever easier, hopefully ever less expensive to operate, and evolve its capabilities. And, and that's a whole different way of thinking. If you're building a plant on the ground, you think that way. If you're building a plant in space, which these essentially are, then that's kind of a new way of thinking about it. Uh, especially from a commercial perspective, and so that that's a challenge, and uh, you know, and I think we'll see some good stuff coming from that as more facilities come online. People thinking long term, what you don't know what it's going to look like in ten years or what the market will demand, but you have to have a way of getting there. Okay. For Spectrum, one of the uh, issues was we we had information and data that we wanted to generate. This information and data was information that NASA wanted to understand uh, biologic function in, in microgravity environments. And they wanted to understand uh, the genetic and, and protein type changes that occurred in these organisms. Easy to, well, easy to design for that, okay? What's not easy is how you take that same instrument and build in all the engineering capabilities to do something nobody's even conceived of yet. Can you adapt that instrument by doing this? Can you change the filters to do that? A little source code, code programming will let you do this. That's been the hardest part of Spectrum. And we think, we think we've got it in there. So we can, we can modify it in many different ways. That, in my opinion, was our hardest challenge for that particular instrument. Versatility, building in versatility. versatility. Modularity for upgrades. Mm -hmm. Jose? Oh, I'll actually um, echo that uh, challenge of being flexible, uh, modular, uh, to cater to research. You have no clue what we're going to be doing five, ten years from now. Um, so uh, being flexible and then simplifying the development process. Um, with something as complex as ISS, uh, going through the ISS payload process, uh, just simplifying as much as possible so that uh, customers uh, can iterate quickly uh, on the research and uh, just making, making that whole process as simple and, and straightforward as possible while still being flexible. And yeah, maybe it's just a little expansion on that. I mean, we, we have a space heritage, so we're used to building custom, it's got to work forever and ever, amen, kind mm -hmm. of payloads. You know, and, and Muses is reusable technology demonstrations. So you sort of got to accept it's all right if one of them fails, because we'll bring it back down and we'll fix it. So, you, know, you don't have to go spend 4x the dollars on, on radiation-hardened material. You know, we're going to try radiation-tolerant. You know, we might use them twice and do a mixture. So, I mean, it's a, I think the mindset, you know, we, knew how, we know how to interface to NASA. We know how to, but, you know, the actual commercial mindset that you got to get into to get a cadence to turn a profit is, is sometimes a little bit harder to change gears on. So the option for accessibility opens up all new, uh, new areas of interest. 
I mean, to me, the number one draw of the space station is whatever I put up there, unless it's huge, but if I put up there a reasonable size, I can bring it back down to Earth. You launch it on a CubeSat, it doesn't work. Whatever money you spend on it is gone. You know, if you're on the ISS, you have an opportunity to bring it back down, fix it, and refly it. It lets you lean forward in your development cycle and, and save money. Great point. Great point. John? Okay. Uh, next question. For those of you with currently government-owned capability, do you see a point where your equipment or technology would be licensed or conveyed to commercial operation? I think that's for Doug and uh, Jose there. For government-owned uh, equipment, when do you think it might be licensed or available for commercial use? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, it, is, it is NASA's desire to license, this is my opinion, most of their capability. It belongs to the public. They would like to see the public have that for future use. Uh, it takes a little while to do that because of the TRL levels we go through. You know, uh, we, we evolve through the TRL levels till we get it to a point where we're at an MRL level. You know, MRL is a market readiness level. That's sort of associated with the TRL process. And uh, I honestly think that for some technologies that are developed in the lab now, it's a very short time period. Uh, for something like Spectrum, like we were talking about, it's probably going to take a little bit longer to do that. But uh, other people can download the uh, design drawings for that and build a capable instrument. Hmm. So that's always a possibility. Jose, you mentioned open source software and already a number of projects, but when is it possibly going to be full up commercial? Uh, so I, I can point to a, a few different efforts already. Uh, so I'll point to cases first and foremost. Quick cases uh, is our big avenue for the commercial utilization of Astro B on, on space station. So first with Astrobotic um, and with Zero Robotics, of course, uh, those are cases sponsored and uh, uh, utilize Astro B on, on space station. And um, and then one other cap Astro B capability I'll throw out there in in the vein of commercializing and, and uh, uh, getting a profit is uh, Astrobee's got uh, uh, skin, a exchangeable skin that can be buttoned off and buttoned on. So in that way, it's almost got a, a uniform that allows for uh, branding, so to speak. So uh, you can even do team, team competitions. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll throw that out there, and uh, definitely a, a, a useful platform, I think, for commercialization. So maybe beyond the color choices of red, blue, and orange. From Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> John? Next question. What is your time frame for return on investment? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> My favorite question. <laughs> so you say the time frame for return on investment. Um, so let's assume you know a, a lifespan of payloads, and right now the ISS, you know, it should be extended. But say we got what seven years. Right now, 2025. So you know, right now my return on investment better be less than seven years. But you know, it, it's somewhere. It's somewhere between five and seven years to, you know, to uh, get your investment back. And again, that depends on how, how fast we get hosted payloads. You know, the, the faster that cadence, you know, if I can do payloads in under 12 months and you're doing technology demonstrations, it's going to accelerate because you can crunch a lot of payloads through there. You can do a lot of missions. <clears throat> but it's, it's, it's somewhere five years. In, in my oil field days, we always targeted three to four years. Mm -hmm. If you couldn't pay it back in four years, you weren't going to get the money. Um, four years is pretty aggressive for a brand new market that's uh, really just getting started. We, we're still trying to generate some demand. Uh, I think if, if you can get your money back in five years, you're doing great. It's a challenge. I'm going to zip up my man suit. John, anything to add? No, I think that's exactly right. I think we're, we're in a new era, new opportunities, uh, a very exciting time. 
Um, and I think frequency of utilization obviously helps. So I think, you know, if we can just get, you know, increase the demand, get the throughput up, um, it'll obviously help these equations. But, I, you know, you really do have to look at a five, you know, five year or less time period um, to be able to get that return. And, and I think, I'm sorry, I think that'll be the proof of the pudding going forward, right? If, if the idea of commercial activity on space station is going to take hold, that almost has to become the answer. You, you know, investors need to get their money back in that kind of time frame. And so, you know, and, and we're, the, we're the first wave, and, and we need to prove that that'll work uh, with all the help we can get. I really do feel like frequency is real important. We need to get the throughput. You know, we're, we're getting more and more opportunities. I think the more that we get, the more easy that equation becomes. Okay. okay. Uh, the next question is for Jose Benavides. Regarding the Astrobeat camera, how available to the ground will the video be? Will this mean more frequent internal ISS video? So uh, the HD camera, uh, referred to as the SciCam, uh, does have a real-time link down to the ground. So one of the capabilities will be able to operate a uh, ground control station where you'll be able to see that live video uh, throughout the operation of uh, Astrobe on, on station. Um, and then there can also be onboard storage of uh, all the other cameras and all the other data for later downlink uh, to the ground. But uh, there will definitely be an HD video uh, specific to Astrobe that will be available uh, in real time. So have you looked through all the different use cases for that video? Um, are there investigations there or, or investigators who've come to you saying, hey, we'd like to get a, additional over-the-shoulder video, for instance? From our Absolutely. Uh, well, so one of the first use cases, uh, of course, was situational awareness, trying to just get an idea of what's going on. So being able to perch Astrobe in a, any given module and view what's going on, because there is a lot of crew time spent on positioning of cameras right. and getting an idea of what's going on in the general area. Um, but uh, yeah, we've also had a lot of discussions on, well, are there payloads that can benefit from a mobile camera or visualization of what's going on, for example, on the outside of Iraq or in different parts of uh, space station, um, different anomaly uh, detections, uh, cracks, leaks, uh, anything you can do uh, with video surveys. So, uh, and then more than just video, it's, it's any sensor that you can put onto Astrobe and in an automated way uh, do sensor sweeps of ISS that typically take crew a lot of time to do, get it to, on this robot and it can sweep uh, all of ISS um, in a very uh, known, known way uh, without crew having to spend a lot of crew time. Thanks. Okay, John? Um, the next question is for Mark Gittleman. On the MISI platform, does the experiment have to fit in the standard tray configuration? <coughs> does, does the experiment have to fit in a standard tray configuration? No, no, great question. Thanks for asking, that's a nice softball. No, we, we configure the trays, um, they're custom. Uh, because we get such a wide variety of, of shapes and sizes and thicknesses and, and objectives. You know, if you need a dog bone pull test sample, you know, that's not, not a one inch square. So, uh, and, and each mission, each flight is a little different. So no, we customize those trays, uh, every carrier, every flight. Thank Great. you. Uh, we have a couple more questions if we have time. Uh, We've got time for about two more. <laughs> okay, the first one is in two parts. Does the commercialization of the ISS impact its status as a national lab? And then, uh, could this restrict access for experimentation due to reduction in subsidies or exposed costs to the scientist or researcher? Can you state that first part again, John? <clears throat> uh, does commercializing the ISS impact its status as a national lab? Let me go ahead and start off with that one, I guess. And commercialization of the ISS resources available um, is, is independent of the, the national lab status. Uh, the commercial service providers, commercial facility providers are, are all up here um, offering their, their capabilities. 
And of course, we want the scientists to pair with the capability that best serves that science. So we want that developed. Uh, they're independent, I, I'd say, of each other, but they can certainly benefit from each other. Uh, it doesn't have to be commercial researchers going to the commercial facilities, or uh, other governmental agencies could be sponsoring research in case this brings that in. And uh, uh, certainly, you guys are interested in the entire field of of research, whether it's government-sponsored research or commercial. I'll just add, with, within the DOE National Labs you mentioned, they're all government-owned facilities, and they may be government-run or contractor-run, but they all have commercial programs within them, every, every single one. So it's, it's a very possible thing for both to live together. I think, it, I think it enhances it because you know yeah. if the commercialization drives the cost down, oh, yes. you can do a lot more science with the right. same amount of money. So right. it's, it's, a, yep. it's a tailwind. And I think we've seen already um, the new users that uh, both the commercial aspect of, of research um, bring to the, the playing field are just increasing mm -hmm. the cross-pollination of ideas that are out there for low Earth orbit and how we eventually build that marketplace. So this, uh, this conference in general is, is a perfect example of how to bring those forces to bear and, and help us develop the low Earth orbit economy. And, and if I could just pile on a little bit, if, if we're right and, and that these facilities help drive down the cost of developing new products and new technologies, then in, in a very short time, you have a, a stronger, more competitive supply chain vendor base with lower costs, more capable products for sale, and and the whole cost, the, the the whole cost structure starts coming down, like we see with with unregulated industries like like IT, and and you know and we and we talk about these facilities, these new capabilities, being able to do that for for suppliers, manufacturers, and and I think that's what we're going to see. And so, in fact, the commercializing the national lab could have just a just to benefit to the whole industry by, by reducing the cost of access to space, you know, starting it at nuts and bolts and motors. Okay. So John, we've got time for one last question and then we'll try and get people out of here in, in time to enjoy the after, uh, okay. after hours uh, uh, discussion. This is a bit of a hypothetical question unless we have uh, uh, some crew members here. Uh, how would current and past astronauts answer the question what new capability do you want to have on the ISS? And what existing capability needs upgraded? That's an interesting question. Uh, we don't have any current or, or past astronauts up here right now. Um, have you gotten any requests maybe from, from current or, or flown uh, crew members uh, with ideas uh, for development? I, I think the, the, the crew, the astronaut corps, likes to see advanced research. They like to see you know, what's the investigator doing in their laboratory? And, and can we provide those kind of capabilities on orbit? Mm -hmm. um, and then enhance from that. Um, obviously make it very ergonomic, user-friendly, um, easy to, to operate. But I, I think it's, it's obviously a, a unique opportunity. And I think they, they want to see us utilize that as much as we can. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. Uh, with uh, Astrobe, of course, we're looking at automating different tasks on space, space station so that uh, less and less has to be done by astronauts. So if the astronauts spend less time maintaining the spacecraft and more time on science or other research, uh, all the better, and I think uh, crew would, could, would really appreciate that. Uh, additionally, um, Astrobe can be used as a tool, a general tool for, for uh, astronauts. Um, and I can point to one example. Uh, this was actually on Spheres uh, a few years ago. We actually got a request from uh, the astronaut Mike Hopkins uh, who wanted to spend some of his free time on space station looking at the use of a, a display on spheres to display procedures. And so uh, we did this extra uh, research looking into programming a smartphone that attached onto spheres and would track uh, Mike Hopkins' face uh, as he operated on, on space station. And so not only would it change its orientation to, to face the crew member, but also control it to be within about a meter or a half a meter from the astronaut, and then at the same time displaying certain instructions or whatever the crew was interested in. And so that's an example of where the crew was looking at the usefulness of these types of mobile free flyers and assistance on, on space station. 
And so I think there's a lot more of that that can be done. And especially with Astro being an odds interactive element, uh, a lot can be uh, discovered with uh, more efficient human-robot interaction. And how do we optimize that relationship uh, to, do, uh, to be more productive on, on spacecraft? I think our, our crew members show us time and again just how amazing it is to live on board station and how non-intuitive some of our instincts can be when applied in a micro-G environment. Uh, they, they certainly bring to mind uh, new ideas and, and are catalysts for a lot of development. Um, I want to thank all of our panelist members today uh, for, uh, for participating, and I also want to thank uh, Cases Ken Shields for helping us pull this panel together. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. If I could um, ask everybody to just hang in there for about a couple more minutes. Um, this does conclude our program for this afternoon and for the first day, and we hope it uh, stimulated some of your creative juices. Um, what we do have is a very short video to show, and then I'd like to bring up um, Mark Mulqueen from Boeing Corporation, or Bo the Boeing Company. Um, they're our hosts for tonight's reception, and he'd li just like to say a few words before we go into the reception. So with that, I think we're ready to show the video. I really look forward to this conference every year, not only just to uh, get to different high technology cities that Cases chooses, but uh, this one's especially nice with the weather uh, here. The rest of the uh, northern hemisphere is uh, heating up. Um, 
I also look forward to meeting each of you because we are a community of space. We're a community of the uh, low Earth orbit space, and all of us are contributing in one way or another and or trying to get into uh, new opportunities. But to operate a, a platform of, of ISS's uh, capabilities takes a whole team and takes a lot of intelligent uh, leaders like each of, your, uh, each of you and of your companies to make this uh, very successful. I um, want to thank everyone for what you do and the expansion of uh, both LEO and our next uh, opportunities into the gateway in deep space because uh, for the young leaders, uh, mid-career and, and younger, this leadership, this engineering, and this scientific opportunity is yours. You are going to be leading this platform. So congratulations to all of uh, our uh, genes and space uh, STEM uh, uh, students that are here. You might see one of them next door in our social or they're here with their sponsors. Tomorrow on Wednesday, they will be doing their briefing. There's five teams uh, all competing with each other, and we'll make a selection from those five teams for an opportunity for them to do a, a DNA analysis on the International Space Station, get the data back, and do some discoveries in their careers. We've had a lot of uh, opportunities there, and it's very uh, outstanding. So if you see uh, some a younger person, uh, say hi to them, introduce what you do. Uh, make them feel welcome and talk to them about uh, space and what uh, your company contributes. With that, I'll see you all next door for the social. Thank you very much for a wonderful day.